Okay. So, what are we learning today? We are, uh, so by the end of the day, we're going to, by the end of this uh, lecture, we're going to um, understand how we can uh, enforce the one of the uh, type safeties in, uh, in C++, how we actually ask C++ to convert types for us the way we want it, and if the consequence of that is not what we expected, the compiler is going to tell us. Let me see what, what that means. Old times, we just casted, we just casted something to one type to another, and we used it. Sometimes those casts work, and sometimes the consequence of the cast is not what we wanted. So we wanted to, uh, I don't know, cast uh, an address uh, to an unsigned integer value so we can see the result and see what is the actual address in memory. And we hope that the address is correct. But we can never know. Because when you are casting, you don't know what is the size of the address. Let's say I'm going to put an unsigned integer, and I cast the address, the content of a pointer, to an unsigned integer, and it converts it to, a, to an integer value. And when I print it, it shows a number. Not knowing that an address is actually 8 bytes and an unsigned integer is 4 bytes. So the conversion that is happening is actually cutting your <laughs> value in half. And you think you have the right address, but it's not. So how can we tell to the compiler what we want to do exactly, what type of casting we want to do? And if the outcome of that cast is not what we asked for, the compiler will either prevent the compilation or let us know so we can correct it, so we don't make mistakes. That's what we are going to do. And that's through constraint casting that we're going to learn by the end of the class. But before that, let's review what we have done so far. So what did we do so far? We learned how the function templates work and everything, and then we moved towards class templates. And we created a very simple class template over there by creating something called possession. And said, we said that we can create uh, a structure that identifies somebody's possession, but possession is not something that you can define what is the type. You, you need different types depending on if I have an umbrella, today's a rainy day, or a hat, or a notebook, or a jacket. There are different things that I have. So uh, the type has to change. For that, we create a template for a, for a class. Very simple one. And we said, I have the person's name. That's always the same. But what the person owns is completely different. Therefore, the template for the possession that we have. Now, now, having something like this is fine, but the problem over here is that unlike functions that they carry a signature with them, the compiler is not capable of finding out what is the type of the, uh, of the template we want to create. And because of that fact, like uh, function specialization for uh, for a class, I have to always attach the signature of the template to the class to tell to the compiler, I want a position of type laptop. I want a position of, like, of teacup. I want a position of what? So it knows what the type of the template has to change to. Where in function templates, we didn't need to do that generally. When you call a function, function has a signature, and the template is identified from the signature of the of the function, where in a class there is no signature. Because there is no signature, I have to identify it myself. Then after doing that, we went through a more advanced thing that is not for OOP244. We identified, we created uh, um, a template for an array, and we said, and essentially, um, to create a template 
as, uh, as somebody who's new in this, it's a good idea to first create the, uh, the, the class that we want for a general type. We created a double array. And then we convert the type to a general type and we make it a template. And we had certain rules. We said we're going to change the focus type to, of the class to the type of the template. Essentially, we went and searched all the doubles and replaced it with type. And then we said, we said, for the second thing, we have to apply the signature to the name of the class because the class doesn't have signature. And I have to apply the signature so the compiler knows what template it's creating. But we had three exceptions. First, the name of the class that came right after the, after the template statement. Secondly, the constructor names. They don't take anything. And thirdly, the, the, the destructor name. Other than that, anything that has the name array involved requires a signature so it knows which one it's supposed to create. So essentially, if I say I want an array of cars, then uh, the, the, the copy constructor, the constructor remains as a constructor, but what is copying is an array of cars. Therefore, the, uh, the signature must attach to it. The name of the constructor does not need to, but the class name should. Like that, we created a, uh, an array of doubles. And I took the liberty to actually uh, uh, implement the deleted uh, constructor and copy assignment for this one, too. So the, the things that you haven't seen last time are these. So first, uh, uh, the copy construction. Um, I'm creating, uh, and as you see, it, it's owned by an array of type, but the name of the constructor remains the same. Copies an array of type, and I am setting the M data in the initialization area right off the bat with a new type of the size that I, am, that I have. So it's going to get allocated, and I am initializing the size of the, of the current one with the one I'm copying. And in the body, I'm just writing a simple loop statement to to copy all the elements, and I'm done. So of obviously, I have to go through the, the documentation of, uh, of, the, of the array and mention that assignment operation between two types should be satisfied. I have to mention what things need to be done, and over here sh shows that. And uh, well, I'm doing a similar thing in the, in the assignment operator. I am not a big fan of reusing the assignment operator in the copy constructor, because as you see, the code for that thing is much smaller than that one. When you're in a test and you just want to get over with it and do it, fine. But when you're actually writing the code, calling the assignment operator has lots of extra things that are not needed, like uh, having an if statement to see if it's the same thing, unnecessary, deleting the data, unnecessary. But the rest, so for these two lines, I am doing all that. So why don't you just put those two lines on? Anyways, so, but this is the thing, and uh, the assignment operator is done. And as you see, because of this, because of this copying, then it's done to test this. This is, uh, 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 this is what's happening over here. I'm actually, uh, uh, the, the, the function that printed the array, on purpose, I'm receiving the, the array type by value. It's not a reference anymore. It means whatever it's going to get, whatever it's going to print the array, it's going to be copy of the array. Therefore, it's going to get created and destroyed. So the copy constructor will be tested over there. And at the end of the thing, when I am actually uh, showing the, the integer array, I am actually uh, having an integer array of 100 being assigned to the, uh, the integer array i and then show the, the copy. So therefore, uh, the assignment operator is tested on line 28. Be okay with this? And if you want to make sure that it is working perfectly, it's not a bad idea to do something like this too. So. You can even do this to, to make sure that the assignment is working perfectly to self-assignment and everything. Not needed at the moment. So we run this, we will see that it works perfectly and everything is fine and dandy. Are we okay with this? With one actually thing over here that we have. What is this over here? 
it says, I have a warning, and as you see, errors for templates are a little creepy. <laughs> if it was just a regular function, for it, it says at line 26, column 17, which is here, the I over here, it says that at this point, you are putting a size t inside the element of the array that is an integer. So you're saying you are putting a size t inside an integer. Truncation may happen. If it was just a regular, fun uh, regular uh, uh, thing, it wasn't a template, you wouldn't get these three lines over here. So it says you are putting size t to type. So it says you, you are in the assignment operator that you have over here. You are con you conversion from size t to type possible loss of data with type being an integer, okay? So when you get an error for the template, because template can be many things, it tells you this is an error for size d to type where your type is an integer. So you know what's going on. So the, why is doing that? Because size t is an unsigned integer, and uh, integer is regular integer, therefore if the size t goes bigger uh, than the size of an integer, then and, and it's going to get truncated and we're going to have a problem with it. So uh, it's a good idea to cast that integer into, uh, uh, cast that uh, size t into integer, okay, safely. So size t integer potatoes, potatoes, they are both primitive types, right? So relative stuff like changing a double to an integer, changing a float to, a, to an integer, changing an integer to a double, all these primitive relative types, this is the most common cast that we do all the time. To do this, to use this, we use a template and it's called a static cast. A static cast is used when your intention is to have two primitive relative types converted to each other which is very fine. So instead of saying over here, instead of saying over here integer i, which is casting in C++, and it doesn't tell to the compiler what type of a cast it is. If integer was a class, I don't know, car, then that meant a temporary nameless car created out of this one, right? So it's crazy. So we have to make sure that what we are doing is actually a primitive typecast. And for that, we use static cast. So instead of just writing an int over here, I'm going to write static cast. And I put that integer in the type of the template. And that becomes that. If this i and the integer you're converting it to are not related closely, it's gonna, it won't allow you to do it. It's gonna actually fail. Uh, it's gonna tell you you can't do it. Right now I'm not getting any error and everything's good. So I'll, I'll, I'll demonstrate. So if I run it, you will see that the error message is gone and it works perfectly with no warnings, right? Another thing, let's say I want to prove that i and j are not the same object. How can I prove it? I can print the addresses of the two, right? So in here, I'm going to say cl. The address of i is. And in here, I'm going to put address of i. And I'm going to do the exact same thing with the j. To make sure that these two are not same objects, OK? And when I run the program, you will see it works. And what you get over there is uh, a hexadecimal number. I can't understand that. Although they are not the same, but I like to see the numbers. So it, it makes sense to me. So what do I do? I want to convert that to an integer, right? So I can see an unsigned integer. To me, an unsigned integer and a double are both same things. Sorry, an unsigned integer and a pointer are same thing. But to compiler, uh, a pointer is an absolutely different type of beast. It, 
It has different behavior. It is not an unsigned integer. When you add one to a pointer, the size of the target is added to it. It is a completely different thing. They are not related to each other at all. So if I want the compiler to actually convert these two, I have to tell the compiler, hey, completely reinterpret what the, the value inside the, 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 the pointer is and convert it to an unsigned integer. First of all, if I just do unsigned, this is the number I get. If I just do over here on signed, I hate this automatic thing. I wish I could turn it off. Uh, I have to do it like this so it doesn't. Oh. Idiot. OK, so if I run this, obviously I'm getting a bunch of warnings over there. So what the heck you're doing? My, and that's the number that I'm getting. If you put this thing in a calculator, you, you'll see that this is not the number at all. This is not the, the, the uh, equivalent of that number that I have in that pointer. So what do I need to do? I have to tell to the compiler to reinterpret that address into an unsigned integer and convert it properly for me. So what do I do? I ask that. I'm going to say reinterpret. cast to an unsigned. And when I compile it, I'll see still warnings are coming up. Oops, that's not right. So maybe it should be a little bigger than that. Still not big enough. And now, no warnings. So now the compiler is, so look, look what the number is and what we got. This is the real one. And constraint cast guarantees that what you are getting is the real thing. If we had a normal cast over there with warning, we wouldn't know if the thing that we have, we just have warning. I don't know if it's right or not. But with this one, I know the number that I'm getting is fine. And not only that, if I try to actually do the casting, uh, say over here, I go address of i. If I do something like this, the compiler even won't let me do it. Look at that. It says these two are not related. You cannot convert it. And in here, the same thing. If I have over here something like I, that will actually work, but this one, does it work? No, it won't allow you. It says, hey, these two are, these two things that you're doing are relative. You cannot, you're not supposed to. That, that you, you follow what I'm saying? The te you are telling the compiler what you want to do, and the compiler says, what you are asking me is not what's going to happen. Therefore, I prevent you. OK? And now we run it, and everything is good. Are we OK with these two things? So these are two of them. Now, for the other ones, I cannot use my example anymore, so I'm just going to let it be. So, and I'm going to go to, to another uh, thing. So in here, I'm going to go Alt F A. And what I'm going to say will be, what am I going to do? So I'll go C, uh, static, and OK, now let me just get rid of all these.
let's assume I want to have printable objects. Therefore, I create an inf interface that enforces it. OK? So this interface enforces anybody, any, fun any uh, class inherited from printable must, uh, must override the, the virtual function print. Are we good with this? Are we OK with this? Next thing that I want to do, but by the way, what's wrong with this interface? Question for the final test. What is wrong with this? Huh? There is no destructor, but what type of destructor? Virtual. virtual. There is no virtual destructor. So that's wrong. When you are creating an interface, I told you, religiously, you need to do this. You add that one just to make sure that you're not going to have any memory leak. Are we good? All right. Obviously, doing that, I can implement the the insertion uh, the insertion uh, overload, right? So I'm going to say any printable object that gets printed should be able to get printed like this. Problem with this? No problem, right? Now, let's say I have a class called, uh, wait, yeah, let's say I have a class called password. That is a printable thing. I want to be able to print the password. And obviously, because it's something that is, uh, because it's a password, I want to make sure I know how many times the password is getting printed. OK? That's why I'm adding uh, an attribute called number of prints. So every time I'm printing the password, I want to add one to that number. Are we OK with this? Problem. Print is supposed to be const, which means it cannot change the owner. So I cannot add to this value in print. What is the solution? The other class code said, remove the const. If you remove the const, two problems. First. A print is supposed to be constant. You're not supposed to change the object. Secondly, you're not overriding that anymore. It becomes an abstract based class. Then, so I said, create an empty print too for the other. <laughs> we can't do that, right? So what can I do? When I have something like this, compiler tells me you are not supposed to change anything inside this class. And I want to tell the compiler, thank you for reminding me, but I want to change only one thing. So I'm going to tell you what I want to change. How do I do that? I'm going to create a pointer to the type I want to change. I want to change the size t, correct? So I'm going to say size t pointer, say number of prints, OK? Now this, I need to set it to the address of number of prints, right? The problem is still there. This is not constant. <laughs> Number of prints is constant. So I cannot put its address in that one. This is read only. I can explicitly ask the compiler to remove the constantness out of that address. Take it out. I know what I'm doing. Shut up. Listen to me. So in here, I'm going to say, hey, that const thingy that you had, that constant cast it to a regular size t pointer for me. Now two parentheses again. And now number of pointer is 
a read-write version of the number of print number of print pointer is this uh, a read-write version of that one. You can actually change it. So how do I change it? Instead of changing the 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 number of prints, I indirectly change the address uh, that the target of the address that is read write. So essentially, I'm saying add one to this address, and I remove the constantness out of the address, so it works. And still, const remains, and it won't allow me to change the password, for example, in print by mistake. And now I can actually see how many times I've printed something. So therefore, if I write a code like this, and I run the program, it actually tells me you printed the, the password was printed 10 times. Are we okay with this? That's the third, uh, third, <laughs> this is third, third type of constraint cast. Removing constantness. So anytime you remove need to explicitly do a precision surgery inside a class out of all the constant things, pick one thing and only change that one in a process that is supposed to remain, keep everything else constant, you can do it. Okay? They say it's, it's a powerful language. These are the things that you have in it. Okay? So you can actually literally dissect your class and access its parts in a different way in the same procedure. Are we okay with this? Are we okay? All right. Next would be Next would be Next would be another interface. So this one was constant cast. And finally, Let's do this. I'm going to bring it over here. Let's say I want an interface for objects that can clone themselves. What does it mean? It means when you call the clone, they create a dynamic copy of their cells and return the address out just to clone themselves. Obviously, we have to, they, those clones, has, they have to get deleted. So this is the dynamic thing, OK? And they need to specify what is their type. Because think about it for a second. If I inherit something out of this, the clone will clone that thing. But the address it's returning is the address of the parent, right? To know what is this thing, I need to know the type. You have it in your project, right? That's the thing. So, and in future, you'll see that I am writing this method to identify what is the type. We actually have something in C++ that does check the type and tell you what the type is. I don't want to talk about it now. It's 345. But in here, because I don't know what is that, I'm going to use this instead. So essentially, I'm saying a clonable object must be able to create the address of a copy of itself and must be able to tell what is its type. Obviously, the destructor is right. Are we OK with this? Now, let's say I want to encapsulate an integer, create an, a smart integer, a smart integer. You know that we create a smart array. Now, let's have a smart integer. If I want to do that, this is how I do it. And I want it to be able to clone itself. Silly example, just 
go with the flow, assume that we need an integer that is clonable. Okay, <laughs> whatever. So it has a data, right? It sets its own data. It returns its value using a function called a method, an accessor called iValue, right? And returns the data as an integer, okay? Why iValue? Why not just value? The reason is that if I want to create, for example, the same thing for a float, and because these are both clonable, I cannot overload anything to return by value and have the same name because the signature will be different, right? The return value will be different. So this one's going to be F value, OK? But clonable and type is set. This one returns an I, and the other one returns an F. Are we OK with this? Are we OK with this? So. I'm going to go in main, and, and also let me add another thing. I have a class whatever. <laughs> it's a clonable thing, OK? It clones itself, and it's W, and it doesn't return anything. So it's another class. So these three classes are clonable like that. Beautiful. So now. I will instantiate few objects in my main out of these things. So I have integer A10, B30, float C20.2, and D40.4. And I have a whatever that is called W. Are we okay with this? Now I'm going to create, because these are all clonable, right? I'm going to create a pointer called uh, an array of pointer called clonables, uh, called C as clonables, and put them all over there. Okay? Are we okay with this? Or instead of having something like this right off the bat, I could have done this too. not to create the local variables and just create everything dynamically, right? It could be either this or that, correct? This one, I have to delete every single one at the end. That one, I don't need to because they are automatic. But both will satisfy my example, so I'm going to remove this one, the second one. Now, imagine. Imagine that I want, in a loop, to print every individual value of these things. So what I'm going to create is a clonable pointer p. OK, I'll set it to null. And I want to get a clone of each of these things and print the values. Why? Because the sky is high. Just creating something, giving you an example. You're gonna, the whys are going to come in OP345. Here is just an example. Okay? So I'm going to say right? And at the end, in here, I want to print the value of the clone. That is P, right? And then after I'm done, I'm going to delete the P. How can I do that? P in int has an I value. P in C has an F value. P in W doesn't even have a method, right? So there is no virtuality over here to me to call them. I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to put a switch statement over here 
And inside the switch statement of mine, what I will do is this. So I'm going to say, I know the type over there is actually, the type over there is actually The type over here is actually a pure virtual method. So I can identify what the type is. But the problem is that how can I cast a parent to a child? That's impossible. You can cast a child to a parent. You can call me Mr. Soleimanlu, but you cannot call my father Fardat. That doesn't make sense because my, daughter have, my, my father has five kids. You don't know which one you're talking about. Which kid? And we are all different. Do you understand that? It's a one-way direction. You cannot cast it backwards. OK? Let's say my brother, whose name is Murdad. I'm far that he's Murdad. Let's say he is teaching database. OK? So, and we don't have a teach thingy because I'm teaching using this, no, not database. Let's say he's teaching sculpting, like teaching you how to create sculptures, OK? Or some art, a painting, right? Something like that. So I, my teaching is a completely different thing. His teaching is bring you to a lab and give you a clay. And to, so there is no teaching. He's not doing teaching. He's training you, whatever, OK? So we have two different functions. If you say, Mr. Soliman, do teach, you have to specify which one. Is it Fardad or it's Murdad? <laughs> we don't know, right? It's impossible to cast the other way, unless I am 100% sure Mr. Soliman Lu is Fardad in this class. You follow? As if when I'm coming in, you say, Mr. Soliman Lu is coming in. You say, who are you? I say, I'm Fardad. You say, OK, so Fardad, please teach C++. And when you come in, you say, who are you? I say, I'm Murdad. You say, oh, Murdad? Please, let's do the sculpture thinking, OK? <laughs> Right? So you should be able to cast upwards if you are 100% sure of the object you have is a parent's pointer to your object. Correct? Am I making sense? You should tell me, teach C++, Mr. Soliman, teach C++ if you know I'm far down. If Murdad comes over here and says, teach C++, says, what the heck? I have no idea what is that. You follow what I'm saying? We can do that. We can actually cast a parent to his child if we are 100% sure what is the type. So you can tell the compiler to shut up. I know what I'm doing. Just do the damn cast and call it. If you are wrong, something crazy is going to happen. Because you simply told it to go to some address that, I, you know, just imagine my, uh, somebody who teaches sculpture wants to teach you C++, or if I teach you how to, you know. So it's not going to work out, right? It's going to be something crazy. But when you are 100% sure, you can say, I want this thing to be a dynamic cast to a, what is the type over here that I want? To an int pointer it comes the parentheses oh this time it didn't do it okay that's that oh no what did I do here like that and then I'll come over here and I'm gonna say dynamic cast this one to a float pointer And then call the f value. And in here, I'm going to say, this is a non-notable thing. I don't know what it has. 
So by doing something like this, you're upcasting it because you're 100% sure this is an integer. In here, you're upcasting it to a float because you're 100% sure it's a, okay? Are we okay with this? I think if I recall correctly, forget it, I'm not gonna mention. So you know that later, uh, we'll, you're gonna know it later. Anyways, now are we okay with this? So that's the fourth one, dynamic cast. That only happens with pointers in hierarchy of inheritance. You cannot cast, you cannot cast a regular object to that because that's con copy construction is gonna happen. It's gonna be a little crazy. We're not gonna do that. We're sticking to pointers, okay? So you can cast the address. You can tell to the compiler the target of this pointer, although the pointer is of the parent type, a child setting. Please call it as, as such. And when you do something like this, you can actually see you, that every, every value is printed and it tells you exactly what it is. And the last one is an unknown object. And every single one is deleted properly because we delete it at the end and yada, yada, yada. Are we okay with this? Are we okay? And that's officially the end of OP244 lectures. You don't have anything else to teach. They need to media. So what we're gonna have over here, uh, uh, so as of this moment, um, you have to, in a public thing, in the, uh, in the general discussion in the, on Teams that we have for OP244, mention your section, and mention what we're gonna teach the next time we're coming in. Any topic you want to be reviewed, you're gonna let me know, okay? And we're gonna review that one. In up, I think we have two lectures coming up, right? It's possible that the last, if you don't mention anything, we're not gonna have a lecture. And it's very possible that the last session, we're gonna even cancel it. So, because you're involved with many tests and things at the end, you don't wanna spend another two hours to come over here. So, and we have nothing to cover, so maybe it's better to sit at home and study. I don't know. I'll make myself a, available as an office hour at the time. Maybe we can do that. Uh, that's that. What else? Uh, the final assessment. Uh, uh, you have already done it. It's exactly like midterm. Uh, it is designed in a way that uh, an average student can easily pass it, um, and only a student with, with very good knowledge can get an A+. Plus. Okay? So passing is easy. Getting B for a good student is okay. You can do it. Uh, for a good student, you can get an A, but to get an A+, plus, you need to be an ex a very good student. So we'll design it that way. So we have all the colors of rainbow in the marks. Uh, previous things, because the the, the, the weight of the final exam was so low, final test and midterm was so low, we would either have F or A pluses. We don't want that anymore. Uh, we want it to really reflect uh, student performance. Uh, I'll try to give you small pieces of code to write and one whole thing like usual. So when I ask you a complete program, you need to remember that you, you have to write everything includes defined statements, anything that is needed, okay? There is, not, there is going to be a question about the class template, but as far as the first example goes. The second example with an array is OP345. It has nothing to do with your, uh, with your OP244 level. So uh, just study that before OP345. Um, questions? Yes. Can I ask a question about this one? No, never. Okay, I'm joking. Go, go, go ahead. No, because uh, when I refer to the notes, mm -hmm. I realized like the casting is put together with the template. So actually, I, I'm just a little, you know, the relationship between template and what type of casting. Oh, okay. Okay, okay. Oh, hey, bye, bye, bye. Oh, yeah, yeah. Re I'll, I'll tell you what the relationship is. Remember that I created the array? And I told you you don't need to because it's a standard template library. That's what it is. C++ is the language of templates. And things like this 
where you need to create a specific type of action that is relative to a type is only possible using templates. Therefore, in the library of, the, of, of, the, of C++, there are many standard templates that they do things that you regularly did with regular commands that weren't safe. Using templates, they did what you have, what you could already do in a safe way. So instead of writing 50 lines of code to guarantee that the thing that you are casting is actually what you want to cast it to, they wrote that code in a template. You just put the type; it does it for you. That's why it's in templates because the static cast, uh, constraint casts are implemented using templates. We couldn't teach it to you earlier. Now you know that these are actually classes, and you are creating a temporary nameless out of that class. And that temporary nameless represents a float pointer. <laughs> you follow what I'm saying? Yeah. That's what it is. That's, so essentially, so many things are in standard template library that you cannot imagine of anything that you can think of that is in a standard data structure or logic or Algorithms even. Like if you want to do parallel processing, run five programs at the same time to, to reduce the, the time, you can actually, there's a template for it. You can actually say, I want this process to be done synchronized in that manner. And it automatically splits it in four to the number of cores that you have on your computer automatically. So if you have eight cores, it splits it into eight programs and runs it at the same time. So you, so all those things are there for you to learn, and that's next semester's thing. So as I mentioned, OOP 345, this OOP 244 is teaching object orientation using C++. In OOP uh, 345, it's kind of reverse. It's learning C++ through object orientation. So you, you, you're learning more on capabilities of C++ in 345. And after that, you become a person who can claim that I understand what C++ does, okay, More specifically, okay. What you see over here up to the end of OOP 244 can be done in many languages. When you continue going to 345, then uh, the powers of C++ actually emerge, and you'll see exactly what can be done. All right, and remember, it's all about type safety. Type safety is the reason for new versions of C++ coming out. They want you to uh, be safer. And there are things that you're going to, like lambda expressions and things like that, when you're going to get to, you're going to be amazed that you can actually hold a function inside the variable and pass a variable to a function. And that variable actually holds logic, not that. We'll come to it, and you'll see it. OK. All right. Any other question? You had a question. Yeah, I wanted to ask you if you have time to can like if AI is a topic of the day. Mm -hmm. And I thought if you can, I, I value your opinion if AI is a threat to our careers or this opportunity. If you can talk about it, I don't know. If <laughs> the answer is no. That AI needs maintenance. That AI needs fine tuning. That AI needs control. If you just let AI, we have two different types. AI could be two different things. It could be benign or it could be hostile. If it's been, let me just pause this. That's not how we pause. There we go. Oh, no. 